Fun fact. Did you know that koala bears aren't actually koala bears? I did know that. That's Do you know why? Because they're marsupials, Pete. No. Because they're marsupials. Because they don't have the right qualifications. Oh, for goodness sake. This is never going to end. <laughs> Well, and if you're still listening and you haven't tuned out after that toe curler from Pete it's to not, begin with. It's not a toe curler. People, people, at least one person likes the dad jokes. Good. Well, good for them. Hope they enjoyed it. Um, Pete is still ill. Uh, he unfortunately contracted uh, COVID and died from it. But I got better. You did. So we're, we're back again this week. But he might be coughing a bit and... Uh, yeah, well, some people might assume that I'm being insensitive, of course, to people who might have died of COVID there. So probably that wasn't a good joke at all, was it? No, no. And the whole coughing thing could have gone badly if I'd made a pun out of it. You could have done. But I'm not going to. No, we're, we're not going to do that um, <coughs> because we're not that type of channel. No. Uh, I'll tell you what we are going to do. We're going we're gonna to do a podcast, Pete, and we're going to talk about stuff. Yeah. And the stuff that what we are going to talk about is... Uh, a, a brief look at Razer's new releases from E3 this week. Yep. That was actually yesterday. Uh, we're going to talk about product reviews, but our, I guess our main topic for the week is still going to be surrounding WWDC or Dub Dub. No, so, no, it's not Dub Dub. No. No. Um, we just want to uh, review a couple of comments and some of the things that happened since then. And also, since Apple couldn't be bothered to do it during their keynote, I thought we'd maybe just do a quick review of where is the Apple Silicon transition. Tim did drop me a text to ask if we could do it. Okay, that's kind. So we're happy to do that for you. Yeah. Um, do, do we need to wear these headphones, do you think? I think we look like sort of Princess Leia rejects when we're wearing them. Is that a... Um, that's a Star Wars Star reference. Star Trek yes. no, reference, it's... okay. Um I think we do need to wear them when we're doing a podcast. What um, what you need to remember, Pete, is that we also have the audio. So people who watch on YouTube will look at us and think we're some sort of sci-fi rejects. Um, or just rejects, probably. <coughs> probably, yeah. Um, whereas people who listen to us need to be able to hear us. And it's very difficult when you don't have headphones on to monitor how loud you're talking into the microphone. Yeah. I, I guess I monitor it and then ignore it and just talk anyway. Mm. But that's kind of my... <laughs> modus operandi for life really yeah and i personally don't ever get tired with adjusting your levels in in the edit so no i know you don't it's because mm. tom edits it <laughs> poor tom he sat right here just off off camera uh, if you are watching us of course it's uh, youtube.com forward slash the constant geekery podcast make sure you tune in and subscribe and subscribe and share and like and comment and do all of those other things that, maybe, um, maybe put some billboards up in your local town with our faces on you know Fox News style. Well, that, that'll keep all of the tourists out, won't it? <laughs> it certainly would, yeah. Excellent. So uh, let's talk about E3 then. And we're not going to go into any detail on E3 because it's a, it's obviously it's a gaming event which is being held virtually this year and various gaming companies are doing keynotes and other things, trying to copy the style of Apple and I think quite often falling short. Well. It has to be said. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think out of all of that, the thing that interests me was Razer's releases because there was a couple of pieces of hardware that I'm interested in. Yes, what were they? So they've got a new 14-inch laptop. Um, they used to do a 14-inch, so this is the return of the 14-inch. I, of course, have a 13-inch Razer laptop. I like the smaller form factor, but that extra inch gets you quite a lot of extra performance, it would seem. Yeah, definitely. And um, 13, as, as I've said before, is a bit small for me. So 14 might might uh, tick that box. Excellent. So what Razer have done is they've taken AMD's uh, Ryzen 9 mobile chip. It's the 5900HX they've stuffed in this thing. Which is a bit of a beast, isn't it? It's, it's a, a lot of a beast. It's like putting a V8 in an old Mini. Yeah. Well, it is exactly like that in in everything apart from it being a V8 in an old Mini. Because well, your analogy doesn't work, Pete. Why not? Because what the, the car analogy. The 14-inch the chassis that Razer build is very modern, and it's also the world's thinnest. Oh, no, I'm not talking about styling. I'm talking about 
you're putting something big and powerful into a very small chassis. That's what I'm trying yeah, to get at. Yeah, but if you stuffed a V8 into an old Mini, for starters, as soon as you pulled away from the line, the Mini would disintegrate <laughs> because yeah. it wouldn't be able to handle the torque um, against all of the rust that will have inevitably built up in the Mini's chassis. You're going to get some Mini, classic Mini haters hating on you now. I, I've driven a classic Mini just once, and it was a long time <laughs> because ago. Because it broke down. <laughs> Well, slash fell apart. It was it was a young lady friend of mine who owned the Mini, and she she let me drive it. And we're driving down this really quite narrow lane, such as we have here in the UK, at really quite a high speed um, for a Mini. You know, not not a high speed generally, but for a Mini, it felt yeah. really fast because they're so low, aren't they? It feels like a go kart. Yeah, what are you up to? Probably about thirty thirty miles an hour. Must have been at least, yeah. And uh, and then I hit the brakes and basically nothing happened <laughs> i was i had my backside out of the driver's seat and i was heaving on the steering wheel and stomping on the brake it was that bad and she's just sat there all nonchalant and goes oh yeah the brakes don't work very well so i, I can top that go on my wife just before we were married she she also had a very old mini and she had a similar brake issue in that they were they were there but there or thereabouts, shall we say. <laughs> but also, the synchro mesh didn't work on some of her gears. Excellent. So uh, we were heading down the hill on the coast road in the UK, heading towards a roundabout or a rotary, I think some, some people know them as. And traditionally, what you do for a roundabout is you slow down. You perhaps drop it down the gear to just give yourself a little bit more, more control and you go round the roundabout and then carry on your way. But aforementioned brakes not happening <laughs> synchro mesh not allowing her to drop from fourth into third so basically she said <laughs> we're going over it <laughs> <laughs> and we did go over a proper full humpy roundabout i'm not talking about in the uk we have mini roundabouts which is, you, you could probably go over and you know there's just a bit of a, a little raise in them i'm talking about a full-on curb <laughs> grass curb fortunately there was no other traffic that was bang bang the other side and we still got married so there you go excellent and uh there's a couple of audio levels that you'll be playing with later tom <laughs> yeah sorry about that tom anyway so it's like putting a v8 into a mini okay in that it's nothing like putting a v8 into a mini anyway the, the 5900 hx benches for multi-core on geek benches about eight and a half thousand and to put that into context, that's ahead of our i9 iMac. Which is a beast. Which, yeah, it's great. I mean, it's a lot of performance. And it's not far behind the M1 for single core performance either. So it is a real beast of a processor. And it's unlocked and overclockable, which is, yeah. you know, quite exciting. Uh, of course, it cannot match the M1 for power drawers, which means the fans will be blowing a gale whilst you're using it and yeah. the thing i hate about razor's laptops is they have the the intakes for the fans underneath right where your legs sit so it's not really a laptop because in order to put it on your lap you have to put it on top of something else like, like a breadboard like a breadboard and i i don't who'd, like who'd use a breadboard for their really f swanky laptop <laughs> not me you um, certainly wouldn't catch me doing that and uh, of course, Razer then announced it with the 3080 as well, the RTX 3080, and that's terribly exciting. And the starting price of 17.99, yeah, in the US, and yeah. 17.99 in the UK, Pete, for for a 14-inch laptop with a 5900HX, eight core, and a 3080. That's no. amazing. No, no, no. You d you do get the 5900HX, mm. but you don't get the uh, 3080 for that. Oh, that's yeah. another grand. Wow! Uh, if you want, if if you want that, that's uh, two thousand. It's two thousand eight hundred dollars or pounds. If uh, if you want the entry price one, eighteen hundred pounds, it's actually a uh, thirty sixty. Okay, so just put that into context, though. Even if it is twenty eight hundred pounds, think what you used to pay, or I think what I paid for that fifteen inch MacBook Pro that I stupidly bought. Yep. Pete's opening Pepsi Max um, for Tom to use for editing, uh, which didn't work out well at all. That had nowhere near this kind of performance. I mean, a, a 3080 in terms of graphics performance is, I don't know what, six M1s? Yeah, it is. It's it is, quite a lot. It is incredible. Um, 
would would be i mean it's obviously it's a gaming machine and you can have it with a choice of full hd uh, 144 hertz panel or a 1440p panel running at 165 hertz and with a 3080 in it you might even be able to get those kind of frame rates in yeah, esports you, titles you do things. need you do need to add another 400 pounds for that but you do get a 3070 for that with that display right um I, I, I we're not knocking it it is a good machine great for I'm going to do. I'm going to deploy the air quotes again and mm. say mobile gaming, because mm. um, you could, um, but also mobile editing. If you're not, Definitely. if you're not um, attached to Final Cut Pro or, or Apple ecosystem, if you're a DaVinci or a oh, that'll absolutely fly in DaVinci. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah really, great. really good. So yeah, I'm, in a 14 inch laptop, I think that's that's the thing we've got to get across here. You know, you Apple make the 16 inch, and I don't think. I don't think there are any processes in the 16-inch MacBook which would compete with the 5900HX. Yet. Yet. And there's n certainly no GPU options that would compete with the 3080. Yet. So you've got... Yeah, it's a good choice if, you know, if you're in a pinch and you don't want to hang around for Apple to release the mythical new MacBook Pros, then... You know, the Razer may be, may be a possibility. If, you, if, like us, you're happy to use Windows or Mac OS, but uh, if you're tied to a particular platform, then maybe not. One, one might say, it, when, when you look at the specs, even for that entry, that I say entry level, it's an entry level for the, for the, for the range at £1,800 or dollars. Um, it actually represents really good value against, say, if you were to get a really over specced new iPad Pro, for you example. Could. You could do that. Let's move on. Uh, something else Razer released, which I think is actually something that might interest the Apple fans out there, uh, is a gallium nitride charger. Uh, so this thing is really quite small, uh, about 40% the size of the actual normal size Razer bricks, uh, which would place it slightly smaller than the larger Apple charger, I think. Yep. And for that, you're getting 130 watts with two Type A ports and two Type C ports. So this is the one size fits all charger. You take one charger out with you, you can charge your MacBook Pro or whatever laptop you've got. You can charge your iPad at the same time and your phone, and still have a port left for something else mm. if you've got that many devices. Uh, a portable screen. That's another possibility. So a pretty cool charger. It's going to be 180 dollars, or probably the same in pounds, but. It's the yeah. sort of charger that you might buy as a kind of, um, you know, something to use with all your devices. Yeah. Uh, and I think it's that's that's worth checking out. Definitely. Uh, they released a new 27-inch monitor with the cool cable management. Oh, that is which, gorgeous. I want one of those as well. They do do nice stuff. There's, they do. there's no doubt about that. Um, we won't talk about that too much here because I think you've got to see it. So go check out on the Razer website. It's very cool cable management. Very, very interesting cool. design. And something slightly off the wall. They've done a face mask. They have. They have done a face mask. Now, first of all, the positives. Uh, the idea behind this is that it has two smaller filters that last three times as long as a conventional surgical mask, which means less wastage. Yep. And that's a laudable goal. Uh, but they've also put RGB in it, Pete. Yeah, they have. And, um, it, yeah. It, I think... I think it's an interesting idea, and I, I like I like the concept, the environmental concept. But <coughs> honestly, if I had to go down to the local Tesco supermarket wearing one of those, I'd feel like a bit of a pillock. You, you would, I, I think, particularly in the, the neck of the woods we live in. But I think if you lived in certain parts of the world, I could imagine you'd blend right in or, or you'd be seen as uber cool, you know, places in like Tokyo and stuff like that. <laughs> what it reminds me of is, you know, we're... we're children although we were born in the 70s children of the 80s and 90s i think it's fair to say and there were a lot of um dystopian films about the future that came out in that time i'm, I'm thinking particularly things like um blade runner and, and films of that kind where where the world was painted as everyone would be wearing you know wearable neon glowy clothing and stuff like that and very tron-esque and it does feel it comes back to what i was saying about the universal translator at dub dub last week is it feels like we are merging into the futures that we were we were we were shown in our childhood yeah although i would ask you this question pete is it the case that these films accurately predicted our future or is it the case that they influenced our future uh, probably probably the latter 
Yeah. And how long will it be until in iRobot style we're having to fight off a swarm of AI robots? Uh, well, I have to do that every time I, I go hands-free in the car with Siri. But um, <laughs> it's... Um, no, it's it's interesting to see how there's almost there's different sci-fi out there, isn't it? And I think you're right. This type of thing has we are, are influenced by things that have come, and then you take other things. And I'm, I'm not doing this to to get a rise out of you, but you take things like the original Star Trek series from the '60s, and they had things on that, like the concept of a what we would now call a, a floppy disk or an SSD or a um, SD card. You know, they were able to plug that into a slot. It would take data and they were able to take that and then take it somewhere else. Well, I would say that was more predicting the future rather than some scientists thinking, that's a great idea. I'm going to go out and invent floppy disks. Whereas I think this is more stylistic mm. and uh, probably it's the latter. Yeah, for me, it still can't beat Space Odyssey and the guy sat there watching the news on what looks like an iPad. Yeah, it was an iPad. It was an Amazing. iPad with an M1. Mm. So um, we've been talking about products. Let's talk about product reviews um, because we do product reviews on the, the main channel. So uh, youtube.com forward slash constant geekery. Uh, I just wanted to cover off a few things that are coming to the channel. So we've shot a review video of the new Pepper Jobs display. This is a 15.6 inch 4K AMOLED portable display that's color accurate. And it's quite an exciting thing and uh, it's quite exciting for me as well because Pepper Jobs uh, is a relatively new company based in Hong Kong. Um, Married to Tony Stark. And they... Sorry, that's someone else. Sorry. Yeah. They sent me the um, they sent me the, the monitor to review. One of the first that they've got in the, in the country. So quite yeah, excited about that. That so, is cool. That is very cool. Uh, that review will be coming up soon. We've also got um, another mini PC which will be getting reviewed at some point. We've We've got some uh, new earbuds as well, which I neglected to bring with me. I was going to hand them to you, but uh, I haven't got them. So we've got some earbuds, which you are going to review. I am going to review. Compare them to Apple's earbuds. And uh, we've got, in, in a moment, we're going to do some iPad cases together. And uh, Are we? Yeah. That's going to be fun. Good. Uh, and we've got other stuff. Uh, it's, um, as, as the channel's grown, we're starting to get you know more and more people getting in touch. Uh, asking if you want to review products and there's been some interesting exchanges uh, msi reached out to me really yeah to see whether i wanted to review their monitor mounted desk light so this is a uh, a light that sits on top of your monitor but it doesn't shine on the monitor screen it illuminates your desk it's a fantastic idea and i was dead keen to try that and what, you mean like a light mm. in the ceiling no but it's on your monitor so it illuminates your, your working space. It's yep. task, task lighting, but it sits in this neat little LED bar on top of your monitor. So okay, with a dimmer control. All right. Good. Anyway, carry on. Well, it, I was dead keen to try it. So I emailed them back saying, yes, love, love to give that a review. Thanks very much. Please send a sample to this address and all the rest of it. I never heard anything from them. And I've never heard anything from them since. So I assume that MSI decided my channel wasn't big enough for them and they, they didn't want to review it. Slight shame for MSI is that we're just about to go and buy a whole load of task lighting for our studio here. So we would have bought loads of your stuff, MSI, but you didn't send us a review product, so we oh, don't no. know if it's any good. No um, that, that wasn't what I really wanted to talk about. Uh, most of the stuff that that we are asked to review comes out of China. So you've got a huge number of Chinese companies making tech and they're desperate for people to review it on their channel. Okay, And it's... It's a little bit frustrating dealing with some of these companies, but I just want to tell you about an exchange I had just yesterday. Uh, a company reaches out to me who have a collection of products. Some of them look quite interesting. There was a USB charger I thought looked quite interesting, a laptop stand, you know, quite a diverse range of products. And they sent me this whole list of stuff. Do you want to review these things? And it's like, so I sent them my, my stock reply, which is always happy to, to review certain products if they're of interest to me and to my audience. Uh, I only review things on the basis that I'm free to have full editorial control and give an honest opinion. And then I, I always say to them, if you want the review sample back, you need to organize return shipping. And I say that not because I'm trying to get free stuff, but because I'm not going to be dealing with all the courier companies in the world sending this stuff back to people because it's... It's hassle. It's too much hassle. If they want it back, they've got to, you know, they've got to sort it out for themselves. Uh 
So I then get a response back to that saying, thank you, we're so excited that you're interested in, in this partnership. And it's like, hang on, what? I never said anything about a partnership. <laughs> we're not getting married. <laughs> That's exactly. That's, you can send me some products and I might review them if I think they're any good. But, you know. Just, just for, for any future reviewers out there, this is barely a partnership, and I see them more, more or less every day. <laughs> no offence, you know. Oh, well, none taken. Good. Um, the next thing in, in their email is this list of uh, instructions on how the review is to be done. Uh, so directing the review. So like a script, basically. Not not a script, but showing the, the things that they, they want to feature. And... Uh, and this is quite topical at the moment. If you've watched Hardware Unbox latest saga with LG, you know that you know this kind of stuff happens. Uh, and then they're also demanding links in the description to their product page and everything else. And I will do that if uh, a company's sponsoring a video. I will put their links in the description. And if I review a product and I think it's really good, I'll choose whether to link to it in the description or not. That's my choice, not theirs. Hmm. And then they said... I think you'll you'll like this bit. For for your first review, choose any products up to a total value of fifty dollars, and if you make a nice review, you can have some more. It's I'm so a bit of a bung, really, a bit of a backhander. Well, yeah, let's if, focus if, well, in focus in on the term bit there. <laughs> fifty dollars. I, we don't review products for the money, and I, so I've told them to please go away. Um, I review products because I think they're interesting for for me, or I think the audience might enjoy this review. Yep. That's why I review products. I don't review products to get free stuff. That's not the point of this, and I don't need the stuff. I don't need any more stuff in my life. I have plenty of stuff. Most of the things I review on the channel I buy with my own money because it's something that I want and I need. Um so this kind of thing really irks me because what they're actually what the proposition actually is from their perspective is they want me to do an advertisement or a commercial for them mm -hmm. and what they're then saying is that my compensation for producing said commercial shall be fifty dollars of product that probably costs them twenty dollars if that right so thankfully youtube is not my my day job so if if the company pete was hiring me out which it doesn't do very often as a con on a consultancy basis, how much of my time would fifty dollars buy? Uh, this segment would probably not be covered by it. This right. segment of the podcast. Yeah. So I mean, you, you're not as valuable as I am, but um, <laughs> you know, you, you're pretty much you're you're up there. You're up there. Thanks, right, Pete. That's okay. It's 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 marginal. It's you know, it's Iniesta versus Messi. Do you know what I mean? It's they're comparable, but I'd probably get a little bit more in Championship Manager. I, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, I am joking. He's brilliant. If you if you need a consultant for techie stuff, he is your man. Yeah, although I I don't really have any time to do any of that. But um, <laughs> thanks anyway. So if I mean on the basis of the fact that I got twenty five years experience, well I don't have. 25 years experience reviewing products so my hourly rate would have to be different for producing a video but <coughs> how long do they think it takes to produce a review video i mean it's le at least a day's work at it, least to do, to do it properly and give it justice yeah. and actually because it's not just producing the video it's assessing the product and if if someone wants a genuine review you know like these headphones that you've given me well i'm going to have to wear them for a few days i'm going to have to try them in different situations I'm going to have to probably do an unboxing before I try them. So that's a video, use them, then a follow-up video, which I've got to then write a script for. Uh, and then it's got to be edited, you know. So, you know, Tom's got to edit that for me. Um, oh, I'm editing this one, am I? Fair enough. Um, that was a joke. You, you need to practice, Pete. Uh, that, that was a look at camera for those that are just listening. Um, my, my editing is lovely. Anyway, um, it, it takes at least a day, if not longer. Hmm. And do, do you know what? This, this whole concept of we'll give, you, we'll give you the product if you leave a nice review, that is why I said to Bugatti, no. Just no. You can keep your Veyron. I, I thought it was a knockoff handbag that they were offering. No, that's Bulgari. <laughs> 
I thought Bugatti made stuff like that as well. No, I'm pretty sure they made cars, but you know, that, uh, well, maybe, maybe uh, they maybe they did ask me to <laughs> the the Bugatti Veyron handbag. It was oh, probably course. a little diecast model. Probably. Well, I say probably like this is actually something real that actually happened and not one of your stupid stories. It's going to um, happen one day. One, one day, day, someone's going to see this channel. Elon Musk is going to see this channel or or someone just say, let's give those boys a Tesla each. Just to review. You know, and then they can keep it. Okay. I, I don't imagine that's ever going to happen. I don't imagine that's going to happen. Uh, the point is anyway that uh, we like to bring reviews to the channel, but we, we also have a measure of um, integrity uh, which is why we're not going to not going to provide this kind of stuff for these Chinese companies who are just so out of touch with reality. It's unbelievable to expect that something that probably ha has a wholesale cost to them of twenty dollars to think they're going to get exposure on a channel with twenty three thousand subscribers, get a video made for them, get links in the description, and oh, they, they were promising further incentives as well if I if I sold ten off at the back of the review. It's like I, I'm not your sales team, just. I think it's fair to say it's not just Chinese companies. Any company that took that approach. Yeah, it's crazy. Anyway, we've, we've probably spent far too long on that. Let's get to our main topic. We did our live stream last week for WWDC. Dub, dub. Dub, dub. And uh, a few people commented that we were a little bit negative. And I, I just wanted to, to touch on that a little. Um, first of all, you were dying. I, I was. Yeah, I, if... Being being completely honest, I it would have probably made sense for me not to do it, but I did it because we said we were going to do it. But it was it was foolhardy. Mm -hmm. And I'd been here early all day doing the review videos for the screen that I mentioned earlier. Mm. Um, so yeah, it was a long day. Uh, we had expectations, and I, I think you know there's a lot of hype going around. A lot of people say, "Oh, well, you just bought into the hype like everyone else." Well, maybe that's that's true to an extent, but I, I think it was always reasonable. We'd always predicted. Can I make a comment on that? Yeah. On, on buying into the hype, Apple are the instigators of the hype. Let's be completely clear about yeah, that. That's true. So, if we're buying into the hype, whose fault is that? What well, is Apple knew exactly what's going to happen. I, I I've come to the conclusion now that the M1 was put into the iPad as a cost-saving exercise for Apple or a profit-making exercise. Um, and I've made a video about that, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, but, but that's not what the way that the consumer sees it, is it? Suddenly you've got an iPad with an M1 chip, and as we pointed out in all our videos, you, you're thinking to yourself, well, the iPad can't use the M1. It can't use any of the Mac features. It can't use virtualization. can't use all of the PCI Express lanes. Uh, can't use all of the power, can't use all of the memory at the moment. Why put it in there? Mm. So everyone is going to come to the very natural conclusion something's coming to support all of this new new hardware. And that's not an unreasonable expectation. And that may yet still happen. Yep. So a lot of people are looking at WWDC as a, oh, well, the iPadOS has been lagging behind iOS some features that are in iOS 14 didn't make it into iPadOS 14 and various other things. So there's going to be a big segment on iPadOS. And it was actually one of the shorter segments, wasn't it? Yeah. And, I mean, if you're into widgets, then it was brilliant. It's absolutely fantastic. But it, but it is interesting, isn't it? They've put this massive, massive hardware upgrade in the iPad and it still feels like it, it's lagging behind. Yeah, and I've got to say... Um, you know, I'm using the, the M1 iPad and I've been using it quite a lot. I find compared to the previous iPad, it, there are certain things that are a little bit laggy on it, like Face ID sometimes lags. Really? Yeah, it doesn't seem to be as good. Sometimes the touch, the trackpad here on the Magic Keyboard is not as responsive to tap to, tu uh, tap to click. So, there, you know, and let's not get started on the Thunderbolt ports and other things yet. Let's not do that again. No. So there's, yeah, you're absolutely right. Apple started the hype. Um, we, long time ago, though, we targeted WWDC this year as a as a halfway point on the Apple Silicon transition. So it would have made sense for announcements and hardware announcements, even though it's a software conference. And we said all of that in our live stream. So any negativity that, that came out really was uh, directed at Apple's presentation, not at the 
the stuff they've done, some of which is really cool. And uh, I'm guessing we'll there's review probably, in more detail at some point. There, yeah, there's probably a whole podcast on the things we did like from that dub dub keynote. Oh, I'm doing it. Stop I'm doing it. Doing it. There's also um, my my brother's particularly excited about the lossless dub, dub. audio in uh, Apple. Dub, dub. Pete, sorry, <laughs> get a grip, man. There's excitement about lossless audio. Yep. My, my brother is an audiophile and he, he's very complimentary of it so far and getting quite excited about it. So I think that's a, a great addition. I think the new iCloud things are all, all good. So there's lots of good stuff. Yeah. Uh, Apple could have probably done that keynote in how long? Oh, they dragged it out, didn't they? They dragged it out. It, it was one of those things that it, it making a meal of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they could have probably done the whole thing in an hour. If they weren't so busy, you know, bigging up themselves and in, indulging in their own sense of self-importance, then it could have been a lot quicker, couldn't it? Um, as a result of WWDC, the we've then seen articles starting to appear about the M1 chip. And what, what these articles are saying is that M1 is actually something called A14X. And let's just be clear, there is no such thing as A14X. It, it doesn't exist because Apple haven't released A14X. Uh, it's the, the name that people assume would have been given to the next iPad Pro chip. But of course, Apple instead put the M1 into the iPad. And so as a result of that, people are saying, ah, well, the A14X was always the M1, and the M1 was always an iPad chip, and therefore Macs have got iPad chips mm -hmm. in them. It's Boulder Dash. It's the other way around. Yeah iPads have got Mac chips in them. That's correct. Yeah. And I so you should I, make a video about that. I have made a video about that, Pete. It's on the main channel. Have you watched it? Um yeah, I started watching it last night. Did you watch it though? When you say you watched it. Listened to okay. it. Okay. I listened to it. Um and Thanks. Thanks for making half the effort so far. That's okay. Um well it was just you, mm. to be fair. So I know what you look like. I know what the backdrop looks like. So I just I just visualized that in my head. And um, and I know what your cufflinks look like, so I visualised those as well. And yeah, I got I got a good solid seventy five percent of that video. It was a long day yesterday. I fell asleep listening to it. No, I just I give up. <laughs> Honestly, I think we should do some calm. You know the calm app that helps people get to sleep. I reckon there's a market for us. I, there. I think you need to shut up. Okay, thank you. And uh, let's. It's all joking aside. It was a good video, and it made some mm -hmm. really salient points. So, for all those people out there that are saying the this fabled A A fourteen X was actually always going to be the M one, well, go and watch that video, and you'll you'll see that that's clearly nonsense. And you know, you touched on them a minute ago. There's so many things that the chip in that can do that that device can't utilize hmm. it's crazy yeah so that which brings the obvious conclusion why did apple do it well uh, cost saving and profit margins yeah. in all likelihood or perhaps perhaps there is new stuff coming but not yet so it could be both uh, you, hmm. it's not a hard thing to think you know if you if you own a business or if you can visualize owning a business and you've got right okay guys we've just invested huge amounts of money in this new incredible m1 chip and um, we've now got to make a decision. Are we going to pursue the A-line chips for iPad Pro or what, can we use the M1? And it's like, well, we can use the M1 because it's got the same architecture. We just need to, we won't be able to utilize these things. And you do a cost-benefit analysis. And if you decide, oh, actually, it's just cheaper to produce more M1s and stick them in rather than producing a dedicated A14 chip, which is basically the same thing but with less in it, why wouldn't you do that? That's just good business sense, and that's one of the reasons Apple's one of the biggest businesses on the planet. Mm. And I think they had to do that as well, rather than put the M1 in but call it something else, because that would have swiftly been discovered and, you know, bad PR. Uh, something that really amuses me on this, though, is the, the PC fanboys that have latched on to this, to this news that, oh, Macs have got iPad chips in, lols, and... Uh, Conveniently, just you know, hang on a minute. The M1 has been absolutely battering the x86 competition and leaving it for dead on both benchmarks and power consumption and cooling and everything else. But now, all of a sudden, because somebody somewhere put forward a notion that the M1 is an iPad chip, uh, they latch onto that like that's suddenly changed everything. No, it hasn't changed everything. It actually makes your argument even worse because now you're saying you're getting, <laughs> you're getting battered by an iPad chip. 
I had it, it's it's such a bizarre thing. It is. You you look at the performance. You don't look at what's in it. Mm. You know, I, I once had a a Volkswagen Golf with a it, it had a two liter four cylinder engine in it, and I took someone out in it one day that didn't know what was in it, and it I mean it it was three hundred brake horsepower. It was plenty quick enough and could beat most things on the road and he was like blown away until he found out it was a four cylinder at which point he started mocking the fact it wasn't a v6 or a v8 and i Brilliant. said i said what what relevance does that have oh well they're better and i was like demonstrably they aren't how you know i've had a i had a, a v8 before i had that and it was a lot slower so hmm. it's just it's it's old ways of thinking and these pc fanboys are latched on to the x86 way of doing things which is the time is running short for that architecture yeah i think well in in mobile devices I, i'd agree i i think there's life left in x86 and i don't hate x86 i have a pc laptop i have a pc workstation i've got an intel mac and i love it yeah so it's you know we're not we're not fanboys of anything we just we just think it's amusing when people try to make these arguments just flipping enjoy the the tech goodness sake why do we have to take sides all the time yeah. tribalism uh, anyway so you've got this this whole situation with m1 and a14x so i see these kind of reports coming up so i felt i had to make a video about that but there was some other absolute stupidity that i saw the day after wwdc and coming from fellow youtubers whom i respect really what was that then well it was the discovery that uh when Apple put the live stream onto YouTube, so whenever you put a video on YouTube, you know you can, there's tags. Mm. You can add these SEO tags. I have heard of these. Mm. YouTube themselves say these things really don't do very much. It's it, You use them to target keywords that are not in your description and title and in the content of your video. So, so if you're, for example, writing a content, uh, a description for your video and... You sort of think, well, that is my description. I don't want to sully it by stuffing loads of stuff in, but I could see people might be searching for this term and this video would be relevant and that's where you might use tags. Yeah, that kind of thing. Obviously, it needs to be relevant. You can't just stuff it full of anything. It, it, uh, Google's algorithms are super smart. You know, we could talk about SEO, not going to, but they're super smart. Um, anyway, the... This particular video had the tags uh, M1X, and I think there was a, a MacBook Pro reference as well. So Apple would themselves, a piece of our ceiling just fell down. That's um, Oh, well, keep going. <laughs> I'll keep going. <laughs> the ceiling's going to fall on our heads. It was a piece of foam, don't worry, folks. Oh, okay. So um, lost, totally lost my train of thought now. <laughs> Where was I at, Pete? So you were talking about oh, tags. tags. Right, so Apple themselves are putting this M1X tag into their YouTube live stream. And so you've got then reputable YouTubers latching onto this and talking about it on Twitter like this is now evidence that Apple were actually going to release the M1X at WWDC but pulled it at the last minute. And then further conspiracy theories are get attached to that which is like oh yeah the keynote it was only one hour and 45 minutes and it should have been two hours. They took out the M1X segment. Uh, well, hang, hang on, hang on, hang on a second. What? Uh, I'd, I'd how are the, Apple going to do, if there was an M1X seg segment, how are they going to do that in 15 minutes? Well, they're not. Unless, hang on, I'm going to cough. <coughs> Unless that's why the rest of it felt so drawn out, because originally the rest of it was going to be an hour, <laughs> and then they were going to do an whole hour on M1X. Yeah, perhaps. MacBook Pro. We, at the end of the day, we don't know. Maybe Apple did pull it. Who, who knows what? I, I can see two arguments for this. I mean, we often say Apple does nothing by accident. But equally, if if you're savvy with your social media and you know people are talking about M1X and MacBook Pros and you want them to find the thing that you're putting up, then of course you're going to put that tag in, whether it's there or not. I just... and. Are they actually going to consciously, if they were going to launch the M1X, would they consciously give the moniker away? Because we didn't know the M1 was going to be called the M1, although I called it, we called it, I called it, um, until until the event. So no one tagged it in last year's WWDC. 
No, and something else to remember as well is that the screenshots, you know, the view source code thing can be manipulated very easily. In fact, that's exactly how scammers do the whole bank scam things, showing you a different bank balance and all the rest of it. So we don't even know that it was genuine. Um, I And even if it is genuine, it's a person at Apple who's responsible for uploading to YouTube and doing the marketing. The board of Apple doesn't sit around a table deciding which YouTube tags to put on. You wouldn't think so. So somebody has made that decision somewhere. It doesn't mean that Apple have made that decision. Oh, and we also know or have strong suspicions that you, um, Apple themselves sometimes put out misinformation ahead of events to no get, doubt. you know, so that the leak bombers turn out to have leak bomb on their face. Yeah. Well, yeah, I, I'm convinced that Apple likes to play with them. Of course they do. I would. If I if I was anyone with any kind of decision making power in Apple, I I'd have a field day with it. Yeah, absolutely would. In fact, I'd be brilliant at it, Apple. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah, Apple, please hire Pete to do that. <laughs> you'd you'd have to move to America and everything. No, well, well that'd maybe. be great. But everyone likes a conspiracy theory, don't they? They like to think that they know something that the, the general you know, people and the really funny thing is no one actually noticed that in amongst all that tim cook was completely computer generated he wasn't there at that event at all he's he's actually gone to mars with jeff bezos <laughs> so everyone missed that but there you go that's our leak bomb yeah. tim is on mars i i feel like if we've got to the point in all seriousness if we've got to the point where we are predicting apple product launches based on the presence of seo tags on youtube videos then it's it's time to take a screen break, folks. <laughs> yeah. Just back away slowly from the computer. Put the computer down and get yourself outside. Go for a walk. Do something, you know, just to get some reality back in your brain because this is absolutely ridiculous. But people do it with everything. People do it with films and TV shows, don't they? They, they say, oh, what hidden Easter eggs will tell us the, the end of this 12-episode se 12 season. There's an arc here, and it, was, it, and it often turns out to be absolute boulder dash. That's my word of the day. Yeah, you've used it twice, and I, I don't think anyone in, in Britain or, or modern society has used that Bold, word at all. Boulder dash was a great game. Do you remember that? Vaguely. You are a lot older than one. Spectrum, uh, whatever. Um, I, the cynical part of me does wonder, though, you know, are these guys really that uh, incredulous or... They just want the clicks. They don't. want the clicks and they need the income. And at the end of the day, people are in their droves heading off to what, you know, read these articles and share them and everything else. If you, if you put up anything contentious like that, a clickbaity, and that's why... These channels have way more subscribers than than, than our channel does. So that's yeah. Uh, yeah. There we go. And, and they do, and they do the special thumbnails. You know, they're sort of like <laughs> someone. We actually we did one of those or a couple of those in the past. That's just absolute <laughs> jokes. It's like when you hold up the M1 like that. It's like oh, I've yeah. got it. But people hate it when I do it on my channel. In fact, somebody commented the other day that they almost didn't watch the video where we did the um, we did one of those stupid thumbnails it, as a it's joke. It's not in keeping, is it? It's like having no. a Jaguar and painting it bright yellow. That's at least the third car reference you've got in. You've got cars on the brain today. I don't know why. A fourth car reference, in fact. I, I don't know why. I, I don't just... know why. I have got vehicles on the mind, mm. but uh, yeah, not necessarily cars. Let's talk about the Apple Silicon transition. What? On Apple's behalf. Well, somebody needs to do it. Well, Tim is on Mars. Bothered. Tim is on Mars. So maybe maybe he felt that, you know, the, the Zoom connection wouldn't be reliable enough. <laughs> I think that it's completely disingenuous of Apple to not even mention Apple Silicon. Hmm. I mean, I, I don't remember hearing that phrase or Apple Silicon or Silicon Transition or anything. I never heard that phrase. They didn't mention it once. At WWDC. You know, you've got developers. If you... I mean, comment if you're a Mac developer, what has your last year been like? If you've got an app and you've had to transition it over to Apple Silicon, has that not been one of the the main focuses of your work in the in the past year? And you're still having to support the Intel platform and the Apple Silicon platform. You can't tell me that developers haven't had to do extra work as a result of this. So where's the thanks? Where's the commendation for all the great work that you've done? Where's the review of all of the great Apple Silicon apps that have been developed by developers? Where's the praise for, for that hard work? I mean, you think of people like, you know, our favorite 
uh, Da Vinci Resolve. Well, Resolve released how many beta? Oh, no, like every couple of weeks. Great they were, job. Yeah. Thank you, Da Vinci. Thank you very much. And, you know, we got a really good M1 optimized piece of software as a result of it. Lots of other companies, it's obviously been harder than Apple made out that it would be because it's taken a long time for some companies. I, I think just just as WWDC was announced, Lightroom Classic got M1 support, yes, which right. is fantastic. But Apple hasn't spoken about any of those things. They, they didn't reference it at all. They didn't talk about the you know, SSD gate, which a lot of people are saying has been fixed in 11.4, but I could still can't download 11.4 on my M1 Mini. Okay. Because right. uh, the Wi-Fi keeps dropping out. That's the problem, I think. Uh, so they haven't fixed the Wi-Fi issues. Um, the USB speed and the Thunderbolt speed is still an issue. Apple hasn't spoken about those things. And I, I sort of feel as well, you know, they ought to address that. They ought to say, this is why this is happening and this is how we're going to fix it rather than just leaving it as a... But they do do that sometimes. I mean, you know, there are times like Antenna Gate where they actually... You're holding it wrong. <laughs> yeah, but eventually brought out a bumper, you know, to for free, oh, which was as, yeah. as much of an admission as you get from Apple. But they are... They're not great at admitting when they're wrong. But they, they are going to end up in a situation where they'll have a class action against them because people will only tolerate this whole early adoption thing for so long. If they don't fix these issues, then it will become mm. a problem for them. Um, so all in all, should Apple have mentioned Apple Silicon at the, at the developer conference? Yes, they absolutely should have done. That's a reasonable expectation, and I'm astonished that they didn't, and I'm astonished that the shareholders would tolerate such a thing. Does it indicate, and I don't want this to in any way be a kind of, you know, what we were alluding to earlier, some kind of sensationalism, but does it indicate there are issues either on the, the actual software transition front or on the, you know, Apple getting snagged up in the whole global shortage of chips? I think possibly the, the latter. Um, they, they bought a huge amount of capacity from TSMC for M1 production, but that happened before covid yeah and covid's gone on you know the pandemic has had this effect for a lot longer than everyone expected and the silicon shortage is really hitting hard you know we've recently been working on uh it's time to replace company vehicles this year and trying to actually get vehicles yep what a what a faff that is they've all got chips in them they've all got chips and they've got so there's a lot of pressure on all of these uh, foundries to produce silicon. So is Apple immune to that? Absolutely not. But they've appeared to be immune to it so far. So from a consumer perspective, I suspect, that factors into the whole expectations and hype thing. Yeah, and it wouldn't be like Apple to say, do you know, we're being affected by it as well, guys. They, they wouldn't do that. They'd just be stoic about it. You know? mm. uh, so I think uh, an advanced version of M1, it will happen um, well, should Apple have announced anything like that at WWDC? I don't see why they shouldn't have done. Well, it makes sense so that developers get to understand what, what new new toys they're going to get to play with and make the best of that development. Hmm. Oh, there so, you go. So where are we in the Apple Silicon transition? Let's just let's just do a quick run through. I mean, I, I seem to recall we did a video where we broke Apple computers down into three segments. Didn't we, we did. Yeah, so we had this sort of entry level consumer segment. We had the mid level sort of prosumer enthusiast and some some professionals, and then uh, the the professional grade. And, to, and we're talking here creative professionals. You know, we can't list out every profession here. At the end of the day, if you're a journalist, you you get by fine with a base MacBook Air, won't you? So we're talking about creative professionals. Yeah. So those are the three segments and that's what Apple targets with their pro machines. They're talking about creative professionals, photographers, videographers, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. And music professionals. So Apple has covered off tier one. Yeah. And you would have expected this is meant to be a two year transition. Two year transition. We're halfway through. You'd expect those prosumer enthusiast machines to be, to be, in the wild now or at least we should be hearing about them yeah although of course in fairness the the first m1s when did they release was it november end of october yeah but they announced that they were coming at wwdc and maybe that's maybe that's uh, well they didn't announce the specific machines they announced the 
that they were transitioning to their own silicon yes, and then they, they the, the developer transition kits so the actual machines came later so so probably realistically we've got another few months before we get to the one year point of the machines yes so expecting machines to be launched at wwdc it would have been nice but yeah i understand why apple wouldn't have done that with all of the silicon shortage and everything else but the, the next machines that are targeted have got to be these mid-tier machines so we've got the the four port smaller macbook pro yeah which is every, everyone is calling the, the, the new 14 inch uh, the 16 inch macbook pro in its base specs would probably come into that middle tier as well a bigger iMac and a bigger iMac would definitely fit into that and and probably a more powerful mac mini yes definitely so they, those would all fit into middle tier and i would expect that all of those would be the next target points and then you've got the top end machines so that's the again the 16 inch macbook pro so you, you might get a version of that with the next chip on you know uh, with more power uh you've got the mac pro there's a rumor of a smaller mac pro as well oh yeah but it's nothing more than a rumor someone's guessed that apple might do that and which may change the whole mac mini debate yeah possibly and i wonder whether we'll see an, a new imac pro as well mm. although to be clear the imac pro was a stopgap to tide professionals over it, who were getting quite yeah, antsy about it, the it didn't really fit but who knows who knows mm. but i think you i think you're fairly on the money with that so so can apple still achieve this in two years well, I think they can, particularly, you know, I think you've made a very salient point that the transition didn't really start until the fall of 2020. Mm -hmm. That's the autumn for our UK listeners, not like, because the fall of 2020 was in February when COVID sort of hit us. <laughs> um, but yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sceptical, I'll be honest. I, I always have been. I always wondered whether the very top pro machines would happen in time. Well... They will at some point if if they do miss that two year transition because at the moment they have got that get out of jail free card. It's like well we didn't actually start shipping until October November time. So actually it's twenty it's October November twenty twenty two. But if we get closer to that date and the shortages continue, then they might at some point go. Do you know what guys? Yeah, we had planned this transition out, but there's market factors beyond and supply chain factors beyond our control, and you know and people keep parking container ships the wrong way in the Suez Canal so um, that's not helping either no good well I, that's our take on it I guess uh, whereas I mean we development is coming on lots of apps most of the main apps are uh, transitioned to <coughs> Apple Silicon uh, or are in process of being transitioned to Apple Silicon so I'd say the software side of things is going really well which again I'll come back to why on earth wouldn't you mention that at your developer conference um the hardware side of things is is almost certainly going to be affected by the silicon shortage. Will Apple get it done on time? I, I don't think there's any issue with them getting the designs done. And I don't think there's any issue with them finding the performance in their own silicon. It's just the manu it's the it's making the product, isn't it? Making the product. Mm -hmm. And also there are some decisions to be made about PCI Express, for example, and supporting cards. You know, if you're a music professional you need to have adding cards to control some of your hardware devices and you need PCIe slots and also you need compatibility. Uh, and last time I checked, my audio interface still doesn't work via Thunderbolt on my M1 Mac. It works via USB, but not, not Thunderbolt. And I don't know, don't know the reason for that, but there, that's so just one of many there's examples. Work, there's work to be done, mm. basically. Yeah. And I, the ports concern me. Uh, the SSD issue, I'm not as concerned about that. We are going to do our follow-up video in the next couple of weeks to that, but I'm that, that's never concerned me okay. because we've never experienced the issue and we've been saying that all along. It's no. probably a, did you call it a storm in a teacup? I, I, I use lots of silly analogies. I lose track. Lots of the sort of things that my grandparents would have said. Yeah, well, that's what we said in my day. Mm. You, you little whippersnapper. I, I was always looking forward to to being old and being able to uh, give Weathers to, original to your grandchildren. That and also go to the post office to collect my pension. You, it always used to amaze me in this country. The the pensioners used to have to go to the post office to to cash their their pension check. And 
you've got all these really elderly pensioners. You've never seen them so sprightly on pension day. Getting in that queue on that morning, goodness me. That was the highlight of the week. And, uh, you know, moving the, the kids out of the way with their, with their canes. I'm 82, you know. <coughs> anyway, anyway, let's not talk about post offices and pensioners. Let's, uh, let's finish talking about everything, Pete, and move on to something else. I, I just wanted to say something, if I may, about the support we had on live stream, Ooh, the live yes, streams last we week. Um, it was so nice to see so many of you tuning in and overwhelmingly positive comments and um, also very kind comments about my um, lungs falling out on, on live YouTube, which is not what you want. But um, thank you so much. We'd love to do more live streams. So um, we're trying to think about how best to do that. Maybe we talked about maybe once a month doing something, but we want it to be, want it to be you know, well received. So we, we'll probably have to get your feedback on that. But thank you for tuning in. Yeah, at least one person liked the idea of doing the Windows event. Yeah. <laughs> Why do we say tuning in? That's an anachronism, isn't it, as well? No. You don't tune into YouTube. You're not there with a dial going, oh, I almost got it, just a bit of snow. Yeah, this is all completely alien to my 15-year-old son. So he doesn't understand any of these. Or, or the fact that we had four channels of TV here in the UK. And you watched what you flipping well were told to watch by the TV company. Didn't you? And, and then at some point we got an extra fifth channel and we were very excited. We and which, then it turned out to be Channel 5. Yeah, which mostly broadcast soft porn in of the <laughs> evening, as I recall. Uh, not that I was watching that stuff, obviously. But it had a yeah. reputation for it. Yeah. Whereas now, you know, there's more channels. And as, as someone said the other day, I can't remember whether it was in the comments on one of our videos or somewhere else, there's thousands of channels and nothing to watch. Apart from Constant apart, Geekery. Apart from Constant Geekery. Obviously. Yeah. So thanks, yes. thanks for um, not tuning in or whatever the modern term is. Thanks logging for connecting. On. Logging on, clicking on our, our link or, or listening to us on the um, Spotify's or the iTunes or wherever you are. We wish you a very pleasant week ahead. It's super hot here in the UK, and uh, we need to get the aircon on, even though we are wearing shorts. You don't need to know that. <laughs> Thanks no. for tuning in, guys. See you again See next time. Again. Cheerio. Cheerio.